Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. Today's episode is a recording of a debate that occurred a few weeks ago between me and Jamel Bowie, who is a columnist for the New York Times. This debate was hosted by TED, as well as Open to Debate, formerly known as Intelligence Squared. The motion was, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? Jamel took the affirmative and I took the negative. Now there's a long backstory to this debate, and I'll give you guys the short version here. I gave a TED Talk about colorblindness back in May, which was finally released about two weeks ago. From what I could tell on stage, the reaction to my talk was largely positive, but I could see a handful of scowling faces out of the corner of my eye. Following the talk, the handful of scowling faces, some of which were internal to the TED organization, grew in number and eventually demanded that my talk not be released. So after a long back and forth, we finally agreed that TED would release my talk normally, but that my talk would be followed by a separate debate on the topic of colorblindness. Now, as you all know, I am more than happy to debate these topics, and I have actually actively sought out debates in the past. For instance, I offered to debate Ibram X. Kendi several years ago and donate all the proceeds to a charity of his choice, but he declined. And whenever he has been asked about it, he has lied about me allegedly misrepresenting his work without ever producing a single example. In any event, I was more than happy to debate this topic, and I gave the producers a few dozen people that I thought might want to take the other side. Jamel Bowie was one of those names. Now, Jamel and I have no face-to-face -face history, but as so often is the case with writers who disagree in public, we have a sour history on Twitter. I think it was four years ago that I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal called Martin Luther King Colorblind Radical. In that article, I argued that Dr. Martin Luther King's values were antithetical to the values of woke racial justice warriors today. At bottom, Dr. King's version of anti-racism was to give race as little meaning as possible and to prefer class-based policies over race-based ones. Progressives today do the opposite. They insist that your race is meaningful everywhere and always. And they want racial discrimination under the euphemism equity to be injected into nearly all of our social policy. So in any event, Jamel didn't like my Wall Street Journal op-ed, so he resorted to the age-old tactic of calling me a, quote, grifter. Now, I'm not one to anger easily over these kinds of Twitter spats, but I remember this one got to me years ago because it just made no sense and it felt like punching down. At the time, I was a college student earning maybe $400 a month by writing, and he was a New York Times columnist making God knows how much money. Yet somehow, I was the grifter. Now, years later, in a different Twitter spat, Jamel backpedaled and claimed that the word grifter was not an accusation that I was in it only for the money, even though that is literally the definition of the word. Anyway, suffice it to say, there was no love loss between Jamel and me prior to this debate, but I'm nevertheless grateful to Jamel for agreeing to participate, and unlike his prior snipes on Twitter, he was nothing but respectful during this debate. In the end, it makes you wonder how many unpleasant interactions occur simply because the venue is social media rather than real life. So in any event, this is a formal debate with opening and closing arguments, and I really recommend that you listen to the whole thing. Colorblindness is also the topic of my upcoming book, which will be out early next year, and I'll have a more formal announcement of that coming soon. So without further ado, my debate with Jamel Bowie. Does colorblindness perpetuate racism? Hi, everybody. Welcome to Open to Debate. I'm John Donvan for I'm welcoming you to this special debate where we are taking on the question, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? We're going to get into the topic in just a couple of minutes, but first I want to explain a little bit more about uh, the context of uh, today's debate and today's program. It's being co-hosted by my organization, Open to Debate, but we're also doing it in partnership. I am delighted to say with the organization we all know and love, and that is TED. So to kick things off, I would like to invite the head of TED, uh, Chris Anderson, to join me for just a couple of minutes. Hi, Chris. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you, John. Um, it's very nice to be with you and with everyone today. 
Um, we've actually long admired Open to Debate and uh, your, your mission. I think the world needs more discourse around divisive topics. Um, and uh, so that's what you do. <laughs> and it's really very meaningful for us here at TED to get to partner with you on this one. So you're, uh, also, you're, yeah. if I may yeah, just say, ahead. sorry, <laughs> to say uh, hello to the TED members joining as well today. It's great to have you here. Uh, it's an important topic, um, um, matters a lot to uh, so many of you. And so it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's great to have this experience with you. John, perhaps you could just tell us a bit more actually about Open to Debate and uh, because some, some of our community aren't familiar with you. Sure. And I want to say we're also delighted to welcome the TED audience. We are thrilled to have you joining us today. And um, to talk about Open to Debate, I'll make it very brief. Um, we share a mission with TED uh, where we, we share the view that hearing ideas is an important thing, that it matters, that ideas have power, that ideas live. Um, but we also recognize that very often ideas are going to be in conflict with one another. Uh, ideas held by people who disagree, but in good faith. And our goal is to get those people together and to get them into a forum where they can test their ideas against one another, to do so civilly and to do so respectfully. And for the audience who is watching uh, this conversation unfold, for them to understand why a point of view um, they may disagree with, which are the hardest ones to hear sometimes, uh, why those points of view are held by somebody in good faith. So we like to explore that by asking our debaters to come here um, with um, with facts, with data, with logic, with critical thinking, but basically to explain why they may disagree with somebody else. And what we like to say is let's be open to something like that happening. Let's be open to listening. Let's potentially be open to changing our minds, but let's in the end learn that we can disagree with somebody without having to think that they are our enemy. And in that way, we hope to um, advance the cause of civil discourse. So I, I know civil discourse is so much of what uh, what uh, Ted has always been about. Um, so Chris, I just wanted to ask you, how does this idea of healthy debate uh, kind of live up to Ted's uh, tagline of ideas worth spreading? Well, I think it's, it's integral to it and uh, should be even more integral to it. You know, we, we believe in ideas and because of our format of these short talks, it's easy for someone to conclude that we think that an idea can just come packaged neatly in 14 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever. Um, and we actually don't think that. I think most most ideas don't arrive in the world fully formed in, in a sort of neat cut and packaged. They actually need testing and they need exploration and they need nuance and they need defending and they need critiquing and and um sometimes at the live conference we get to do this and the talks online people don't see that as much and so it's it's actually very exciting to have this chance now to dive in deeper and and nuance is one of our favorite words here um and today's event is definitely going to explore an idea that we hope we can explore with some nuance it's it's been one that has been uh debated for decades it's very much been in the headlines uh, recently as a result of the Supreme Court's decision to strike down affirmative action in college admissions. Um, and it uh, I'll, I'll let you take it uh, because we really got the inspiration from, from a TED talk. Well, indeed, <laughs> one of today's debaters, Coleman Hughes, gave a talk about colorblindness at our flagship event this year in, in Vancouver. Um, and um, it's a powerful talk and it, and it sparked uh, a, a lot of emotion, a lot of reaction, a lot of pushback, a lot of discussion, a lot of interest. And so it's, it's, I think it's going to be, it's a, it's a wonderful chance to dive deeper into, into that issue. And it's, it's a test on something that people feel so passionately about, about whether we can do this, John, whether we can actually, you know, debate it in good, in good spirit and, and in good faith and so forth. I'm, I'm excited to see how this goes. Well, as you say, it inspired this program we're about to do now. And um, um, again, we're very glad to see how this works out the first time that we're partnering this way. Um, Chris, thanks so much for kicking things off with me. And we'll get started in just a moment. Thank you. Good luck. So to what we are debating this time, when the Supreme Court recently struck down the use of affirmative action in college admissions, one of the concepts that the conservative and liberal justices disagreed on was that of colorblindness. The idea that not using race to determine either one's judgment of another person or how to offer opportunities to another person is the most fair way to proceed and amounts to treating everyone equally. But colorblindness defined that way also has many critics who say that the concept overlooks the realities of racism that persists in our society.
And that not taking race into account in many situations is the opposite of being fair. So the court may have settled the law on affirmative action for now, but colorblindness as a value is far from a settled question. And that is what we are taking on in this debate where we are asking, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? So let's get to it and meet our debaters. Answering yes, in uh, arguing that the answer to that question is yes, I want to welcome New York Times columnist Jamel Bowie. Jamel, welcome back to Open to Debate. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. And answering no to that question, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? Host of the podcast, Conversations with Coleman, contributing writer to the Free Press, Coleman Hughes. Coleman, you are also a previous guest on the program. So I want to say to you also, welcome back to Open to Debate. Great to be back. So before uh, we get started, I just want to explain that we're going to have uh, uh, some structure to this. The debaters will have in an opening round an opportunity to make their case, and then we'll have some conversation. And then after that, we'll have some questions uh, and we'll sum up with closing statements from each of the debaters. So let's get on to our opening statements. We want each of you to take a few minutes to explain your position. Jamel, you are up first. Once again, in answer to the question, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? You are saying, yes, it does. Please tell us why. All right, let's get started. So as you said, the question at hand is, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? And I think that before I try to answer the question, it is worth defining the terms of the question, in part because people have different senses of what each of these words mean. So colorblindness, I think it's fair to say, in its modern form is generally understood, as Coleman has written, in fact, to be the idea that we should strive to treat people without regard to race in our public policy and our private lives. My main concern here is public policy. So I think we can say that to be colorblind means that the state in, in particular does not see race as a social reality, does not acknowledge it. But I think this actually raises an additional question, which is what is race? And we know that race does not exist independently of a set of historic condi conditions. Uh, specifically, the modern idea of race as we know it emerges out of the subordination of indigenous Americans and various groups of Africans during the 16th and 17th centuries. It was a conceptual schema that explained and justified their enslavement and exploitation. And so I think given those facts, we would be on safe ground to say that race refers to the set of social relations produced by racism. It is the mark on our social reality left by the fact that one group needed some kind of ontological explanation for why another group was destined to be enslaved. So if that's race, then our definition of racism is straightforward. In terms of social policy, it should be broadly agreeable to say that racism, emphasis on the ism here, is a system of social action meant to inscribe relationships of subordination and domination between groups. The political, ideological, economic, juridical systems created to preserve a supposedly natural domination of one group over another, that's racism. We could restate the question here, I think, using these terms, but it would sound a little convoluted, so we're gonna rearrange things a bit to make meaning clear. When we say perpetuate, we mean to continue on or to reinscribe. Uh, to say that we to say that we are reinscribing a problem is to say that we aren't alleviating or ameliorating it. So one way we could pose our initial question is to ask, can you ameliorate racism as a system of subordination and domination while turning a blind eye to the social relations produced by that subordination and domination? Now, if racism is simply another form of inequality, and that's what it is, then our question really is about how we address inequality generally. So I think we can substitute inequality for racism in the question and pull it up a level of abstraction to this. Can you ameliorate a system of inequality without reference or retention to the social relations produced by that system of inequality? And I think the obvious answer is no. Consider class. Class is not simply a question of income. It is a relationship between two groups or multiple groups as it relates to production. And as a result, we mostly recognize that to reduce or, or even end class inequality, we have to also take account of class domination. We can't simply redistribute wealth from one group to another. We have to do something about the relationship between laborers and owners of capital and everyone in between. 
Otherwise, we end up in the same place that we started. And so back in the 1930s, when we began to really tackle class inequality in a serious way, we passed both the Social Security Act and the Works Progress Administration, but also the National Labor Relations Act aimed directly at reconfiguring the relationships between workers and non-workers. We recognize that it was not simply people who are disadvantaged, it was workers, and we acted accordingly. So unless racism is a special kind of inequality, then the same goes for it as well. The way to address it, to ameliorate it, is to at least take note of and respond to the social relations that structured and continue to structure its ongoing existence. Uh, and that would put us against uh, an ideal of colorblindness. Thank you very much, Jamel. Um... Coleman Hughes, you are up next. Uh, you are answering no to the question, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? Here's your chance to tell us why. Okay, I'd like to thank Ted and Open to Debate, uh, open to debate for setting this up and Jamel for participating. Uh, this is an issue that is near and dear to my heart, so it's a privilege to have the opportunity to speak about it. Our question today is, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? And my answer is an emphatic no. Colorblindness historically and today is actually the best way to fight racism. Colorblindness doesn't mean pretending not to see race, right? We all see race, of course, we can't help it. It means that once we've noticed race, we still commit to treating people without regard to it, both in our personal lives and in our public policy. Colorblindness is the antidote to the poison of racism. Now, there's been a very dishonest but effective PR campaign against colorblindness for decades. It's been painted as somehow naive at best or actually racist at worst. But I'm here to say today that the principle of colorblindness, the same principle with which uh, my opponent attacks today, is the one that our most celebrated civil rights luminaries wielded to great effect in the battle against white supremacy and segregation. The idea that colorblindness is racist is not just untrue, it's the opposite of the truth. The leader of the most important abolitionist organization, Wendell Phillips, said in 1865 that the end goal of the abolition movement was to create a government colorblind. The founder of the original March on Washington movement, A. Philip Randolph, had atop his list of demands the elimination of every law that made a racial distinction. Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP made Justice Harlan's phrase, our constitution is colorblind, their mantra, and quoted his Plessy dissent in nearly every anti-segregation court case they filed. The senators who sponsored the Civil Rights Act literally called it colorblind. Bayard Rustin wrote that race-based preferential policies had nothing to do with and were indeed antithetical to the civil rights movement. Now, my opponent's in the rather unenviable position of having to argue that all of these civil rights activists were somehow perpetuating racism by promoting colorblindness. It's not just not true, it's the opposite of the truth. Our failure to enshrine colorblindness has led to a list of disastrous race-based policies. I could talk about the restaurant revitalization program, which you heard about at TED, where emergency funds for restaurants were handed out primarily based on race and gender identity. I could talk about Governor Kathy Hochul's recommendation to hand out limited COVID antivirals based in part on racial identity of the patient. Or we could talk about affirmative action. Now, my opponent's employer, the New York Times, ran an interesting podcast about it last week. They noted a college tutor in Queens uh, who had lots of Asian students as young as 16, 17 years old who were desperately scrubbing their applications of any sign that they might be Asian, erasing things like chess club and math club because they know the admissions officers on the other end would devalue their application if they were known to be Asian which is virtually identical to what Jewish kids had to do applying to college in the first half of the 20th century. And once again, my opponents in the unenviable position of arguing that it's not these policies that perpetuate racism, but it's somehow ending them, which is really racist. Again, I submit it's not just untrue, it's the opposite of the truth. If you wanna fight racism, remove race from public policy. And if you wanna fight injustice, do so based on class. And by definition, class policies will disproportionately benefit Blacks and Hispanics because they are disproportionately likely to be poor. That was the position of the civil rights movement. And that is my position today. Thank you, Coleman. And thank you, um, Jamel. So we're going to now move into the conversation section of the program. We'll be right back with that. 
Welcome back to Open to Debate. I'm John Donvan, and we have uh, Jamel Bowie and Coleman Hughes debating this question, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? And in the opening statements, we saw uh, fundamentally where they disagree, uh, Jamel Bowie taking the, the point of view that um, to embrace colorblindness is to turn a blind eye to reality, the reality that uh, racism exists and continues to exist. He makes the point that you can't address uh, you can't begin to address inequality if you don't want to name and acknowledge that inequality. He cites several examples in other contexts where it's been named and addressed, but he asks why on the question of racial inequality, do we have to pretend uh, that it doesn't there? And he does feel that it amounts to a pretense. Um, Coleman Hughes uh, argues the, the opposite point of view. He says that uh, colorblindness is the antidote to racism. He would, as he said, enshrine enshrine colorblindness in our institutions and in our thoughts and ideas and in our documents and that the failure to do so has actually exacerbated racism leading to a race conscious policies that he has described as disastrous. I wanna go uh, take take this in, in parts and pieces. I would like to ask each of you to actually uh, not just continually make your opening points but to respond to some of what your opponents have been saying as I bring those up. Um, Jamel, I wanna go to you first and um, ask you to address um, to address Coleman's recitation of the list of uh, of starting with abolitionists and others who have uh, pushed back against uh, uh, obvious manifestations of racism, and then through the leaders of the civil rights movement embracing colorblindness as he defines it, and he went through quite a long list of that. And I'd like you to address take on the historical aspect of the term uh, colorblindness as uh, Coleman has done, and please respond to it. Sure thing. Um, I want to be begin this with a focus on Wendell Phillips in particular. If people aren't aware of Wendell Phillips. He's probably the, one of the most famous abolitionists of the antebellum period, sort of really a luminary, a Garrisonian, um, a colleague, contemporary of Garrison, Frederick Douglass, et cetera, et cetera, a really important guy. So it's, it's really significant that Coleman uh, points to Wendell Phillips as kind of the origin point for the term colorblindness. And in Coleman's gloss, he says that what Phillips meant was a government that did not recognize race in any manner, that took an entirely neutral approach to citizens. But that's, I, I don't think that's quite correct. So Wendell Phillips uses the term colorblind, or specifically the phrasing government colorblind, in two instances, at the beginning of 1865, the first time he uses them. The first is at a speech at the 32nd meeting of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society on January 26th, and again, a month later, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music on February 23rd. Now, the first instance is interesting because it's a big debate between Phillips and Garrison and Douglas and other abolitionists over President Lincoln's initial reconstruction policies. Now, Lincoln's initial reconstruction policies centered on the quick readmission of Louisiana to the Union. Louisiana kind of captured very relatively early on in the war. And Lincoln's plan essentially is we have a percentage, about I think 10 or 15% of uh, Louisiana residents pledged to the Union, and then they can be readmitted on full privileges. And in the relevant portion of the speech, the portion that leads up to the use of the phrase government colorblind, Phillips excoriates this policy. And the reasoning he gives is that simply readmitting Louisiana without any attention to the relationships of subordination and domination between whites and blacks in the state would not address anything. It simply recapitulate the conditions of slavery. We'd be right back to where we started. Uh, it's in that context that he says a government colorblind, no distinction of race in the camp or of in the Senate. Uh, so colorblindness here in the context of the portion of the speech does not mean the non-recognition of race. It means the non-recognition of racism. That is the rejection of the legitimacy of any kind of hierarchy by the state. The state says there's no race hierarchies. No one is above or below. So, so Jamel, you, it sounds like you are saying that this tension uh, that we're discussing today is 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 120 years old. That this this disagreement about what we meant by colorblindness goes way back. Right, and I, want to and take I that I, to I, Coleman to to respond I want, to. Just real quick, I want to say sure. my immediate point is that the the way in which Coleman's using evoking Phillips just isn't correct. Phillips is essentially making a race conscious argument, but using a different kind of language. And we run into trouble oh. when we transpose today's meaning of a particular word onto the past. Okay, so so Coleman, um, your an, an initial challenge is that it, from Jamel uh, in relating to Phillips is that even then, this this um, 
disagreement over what the term meant existed and was relevant and had impact. Well, I'll quote. Uh, I'll I'll start simply by quoting um, Wendell Phillips, and I will let the audience decide what he means by this quote. When once the nation is absolutely irre irrevocably pledged to the principle, sorry, this is the wrong quote. Sorry, no, start over. Start again. Yeah, sure. I, I will start by quoting a, a relevant passage from Wendell Phillips, and you can decide what you think it means. Quote. God has chained this generation to the one great duty of eliminating from American politics the idea of race. Whenever an American magistrate is colorblind, unable to distinguish white from black, when that day comes, the duty of this generation is done and sealed and this epoch is closed. So I, to, to me, I, I suppose reasonable people might disagree about any number of historical figures and, and what they believed, but it seemed very much that by colorblind, he meant what I mean by it. And um, when he passed away, when Phillips passed away, America's first black judge, um, George uh, Lewis Ruffin, described him as one of the few white Americans wholly colorblind and free from race prejudice. Taken together, it seems that, you know, Wendell Phillips really meant colorblind when he said colorblind. Can I, can I respond to that real quickly? Yeah, sure. Please do. Just, um, so the thing to consider is that Phillips is not just speaking in the abstract here, right? He has a set of policies that he would like to see the government pursue. And again, we have to remember, we have to consider the context of the late 1860s. And so what Phillips wants is first and foremost, he wants black Americans to have the vote, which is considered at the time to not be a colorblind policy. It's very much considered to be a race conscious policy. And he describes it as such in this 18, in this January 26, 1865 speech. The second thing is he wants the redistribution of land specifically to freed people, but also some free people. And so again, this is not a colorblind policy uh, as we understand it today. So you we're, we're left with kind of a bind, right? Like, is Phillips just self-contradictory? Does he just is he is he is he is he contradicting himself, or is he again not talking about the recognition of race as identity, but the recognition of racism as a system of caste and subordination? There was not really a language for race as identity back in the 19th century, but there was a language of race. Uh, and racism as caste and subordination. And the subsequent examples that Coleman used in his opening of Harlan, of the civil rights movement, of A. Philip Randolph, who described himself even as a, a race man. So it seems like weird to say that he considered himself a race man, someone interested in the, the, uh, the, the fate of African-Americans, but also a staunch colorblind figure. Um, uh, these figures are also talking about a context where race means in public policy, in, in judicial policy, it means a system of subordination. It means a system of domination. And so in that context, colorblindness takes on a very different hue, no pun intended, and the solutions that these folks come up with um, are not ones that pay zero attention to those relationships of subordination and domination. Okay, it's it's clear that the two of you disagree on the significant on, on how you interpret the his, historical use of the term. But I want to move now on Coleman for you to address the thrust of what I believe is Jamel's opening argument that colorblindness also amounts to essentially being blind to reality. Turning a blind eye to reality was the phrase that he used, and that turning a blind eye to that reality means not deal not setting yourself up to deal with that reality. So can you address that piece of his argument that you've, you've got to see it, you've got to name it to address it? This is a total straw man. You know, I, I think everyone would acknowledge that race is a social reality. There are also many other variables in life that are social realities like um, beauty, nepotism, height. Scientists will, will find that people have an average tendency to treat people differently on along all kinds of dimensions, it's a separate question how one fights that. If you want to fight it by re-enshrining that same principle into policy and trying to reverse discriminate along those lines, well, that's fine. That may be your position. 
But you can't then say to people who disagree with you, well, you just aren't acknowledging that this is a social reality. If you want to discriminate along a particular dimension, you should simply own that position, but you shouldn't say of your opponents that you guys are saying this, this social reality uh, doesn't exist. These are two different positions. So Jamel Coleman takes issue with, with your claim that it's a head in the sand attitude. Yeah. So I, I should say first that it's a bit of a category error to analogize race to beauty or height or eye color, or, you know, there are plenty of things we can point to that have some sort of like differential impact on people's lives, like qualities of that sort. But that's not what race and racism are. They aren't analogous to this, first of all, because they're not biologically real, right? Like skin color is, but the meaning we attach to it is socially constructed, a phrase I'm sure everyone's heard. But the second is the United States isn't marked by a system of hierarchy based off of hair color or based off of height. There was no kind of like Jim Crow for short people, right? There was a system of subordination and domination beginning in slavery, recapitulated and reinscribed after Reconstruction, continued through Jim Crow, spread across the country, that did structure people's outcomes based off of this thing that we call race. And I want to I want to make really clear what we're talking about here, the material elements of this. What we're talking about is entrenched segregation, it's exposure to concentrated poverty, it's persistent exclusion from the labor market, it's exposure to premature death, it's the degradation of political equality in a system that hinges on it. And so to tackle these things, which come as a bundle, right? Some some groups are affected by one or the other, but racism bundles them up and attaches them to particular groups. It seems to me to, as to use your phrasing, kind of head in the sand to then pretend like we're not seeing who exactly that right. it's responding to. And I, just real quick, I'll note as an example, even with the Supreme Court's recent ruling with affirmative action, that same in the same term, the court said we can use that kind of history when making decisions about voting, about maps, right? The government is not actually blind to this stuff in some circumstances. So I'm asking, why does it need to be like, why do we need to be blind to this apparently in all circumstances? Coleman? Jamel is right to point out that, um, you know, beauty and hair color are not analogous to race in, in every sense. I, I wasn't saying that. I, I was just saying in the sense of his, his previous argument. Um, but, you know, certainly the people, the, the, the civil rights luminaries of the past from Dr. King uh, on down were hardly head in the sand about the history of racism and they knew it on a visceral level uh, that even we today could not. And yet their solution, solution may be too strong a word, but their proposal to address it was colorblind policy and class-based anti-poverty policy, right? Do Dr. King in his book, Why We Can't Wait, he addresses this specific problem of preferential treatment or compensation for what would have been then called the Negro. And what he said, his proposal, and he knew that there was affirmative action going on in India. He instead proposed something he called the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, which would target the white and black poor alike. Now, the advantages of this are twofold. First is that class is a closer proxy to true disadvantage. So you are actually targeting more precisely the problem you're trying to address, which is intergenerational poverty, regardless of its skin color. And secondly, class-based policies tend to be more popular than race-based policies, I think precisely for that reason, because most people that have um, had any kind of you know diverse life socioeconomically or racially, uh, at least many people, and I would share this instinct, have the instinct that the true disadvantage is class and poverty. That is really closer to what we mean when we're talking about privilege and disadvantage than skin color, especially nowadays. So certainly the people that would acknowledge all and lived through all the history that Jamel is talking about and fought it, they actually had my position. So, Jamel, I, I, I want to pick off from that very thought, uh, given that at the beginning, Coleman talked about, uh, again, s several people uh, who were involved in civil rights movements citing, using the word colorblindness, and I know we're having a disagreement about what they intended by that, but using the word colorblindness as a positive, as a value, as something to be worth aiming for. And I think that that, that understanding of it has, has broad popular appeal. 
But I want to ask you, is, is it your contention that those who are asserting and uh, asserting uh, colorblindness as a positive value, are they cynically weaponizing the term or are they sincere and perhaps in your view misguided? I think people are sincere. I would not accuse someone of cynically using a term uh, in the absence of any evidence of, of cynical use of the term. I think they're very sincere. I, I, there, there's some, are some, there are a few substantive points that Coleman made that I really think are worth addressing, and that is his continuous advocation of civil rights luminaries, and Dr. King, Bayard Rustin, as hum, uh, somehow advocates for an entirely race-neutral set of policies. Now, we can say for certain that Rustin and King were wanted eventually a colorblind society, one in which race had no particular significance on people's lives, and I want that society as well. I think we can all agree on that, or 99% of us. But when it comes to, when it came to dealing with the situation of Black Americans in the 60s and the 50s and the 70s for Rustin and for others who survived that decade, I think, I think it is a little disingenuous to suggest that they were absolutely opposed to race-conscious policies, right? King was a social Democrat, supported broad-based anti-poverty programs, but in interviews, in a number of speeches, not just in Why We Can't Wait, but in a number of speeches and books, he made clear so that he let, was- let, I, I wanna stop you there, Jamil, because yeah. I wanna go right to that point to Coleman, yeah. that that in fact, uh, Coleman Jamel is saying that Dr. King and others, while using the term colorblindness as an aspiration, potentially long-term aspiration, that they were not opposed to, uh, to, to, to race specific solutions and policies. And I'm sure that he can uh, that Jamil can cite some examples, but it it sort of is a challenge to your view to to your claim that they were. Uh, I think you're making the case that they would not have wanted anything that would be race specific. He's saying that's not true. I'm not sure he can cite examples actually, and I, I but I'm sure that I can. So, for example, Bayard Rustin, who and Ghost wrote parts of uh, MLK's book Why We Can't Wait and organized the famous March on Washington. Um, and was in MLK's inner circle, he said he wrote to the Wall Street Journal in 1974 when affirmative action was a controversy. He said, quote, the controversy over quotas and preferential treatment did not originate in the agenda of the civil rights movement. The leaders of the civil rights movement, King, Randolph, Wilkins, and others, were explicit in opposing reverse discrimination. They were opposed on philosophical grounds, but were also motivated by pragmatic political considerations. Now, I think it would be convenient for my opponent in this debate if there were analogously explicit quotes of someone like Dr. King or Rustin saying, actually, we're for this, like we're for race-based policy, but I'm not sure that they actually exist. So in 1987, a writer made the exact argument that Coleman is making now that Bayard Rustin was a firm opponent of anything that might smack of race preferences of anything of them of the of the of the sort and the chairman one of the chairman of the a philip randolph institute wrote to the new york times to contest this and say in fact that well uh well rustin was president of the a philip randolph institute in the 1970s his exact time period he was also board chairman of the recruitment and training program designed to rectify underrepresentation of blacks and other minority groups in the construction and building trades before budget cuts during the Reagan era scheduled the program, it placed 18,000 qualified minority group members as apprentices in the building trades nationally. This clarifies, uh, and he goes on to qu qu clarify that Rustin was not opposed to race consciousness and public policy. He was opposed to quotas, which he viewed as undemocratic, but he was not opposed to race consciousness. And I would, I would ask Coleman not to equate the two things, right? You can be opposed to quotas, not opposed to race consciousness, because that can take very many different forms when it comes to making public policy. Do we think King and Rustin would be opposed to what is now a policy of targeting for integration, right? Segregated areas. That is race consciousness and public policy. That's addressing particular relationships of domination and subordination. It's not a quota, though. So are, are we contending that King and Rustin and Randolph would be opposed to targeted integration efforts? I don't, I don't think so. And so let's not let's not equate different uh, different different categories of policies under a single umbrella. 
Okay. Uh, the, the, the documentary I just briefly, record briefly disputes Coleman's claim here. Yeah, I, I do want to move on to one more topic, but Coleman, you please take a response to that. I just, Rustin's position, which is uh, consistent with the, I think, later description by the leader of the A. Philip Randolph Association, was that there should be aggressive outreach to minority and Black candidates, followed by a strict judging by the merit principle. Now, if if that's your position, that is a that that is far closer to the colorblind position in terms with respect to the merit principle than it is to the current status quo of race conscious policy. I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think you can point to it. Quotas have been illegal in the United States for decades now, so it, you're making a distinction here that doesn't actually exist and sort of subsuming what is actually race conscious policy under this rubric of colorblindness. In which case, yeah, I guess we I guess we all agree. Hold on. He said quotas and preferential treatment in the quote that I said. I would just like to point that out. All right. I want to go to um, the the most recent uh, very, very public uh, publication and discussion uh, of the issue of colorblindness, which, of course, goes to the Supreme Court's decision to strike down uh, affirmative action in college admissions. And Justice Thomas wrote a 53-page concurring opinion in which he uh, asserted uh, several times that the Constitution itself is colorblind. He also took issue with some of the liberal justices who, who Jamel were essentially arguing your position that uh, colorblindness would be, was to, um, to, to make oneself blind to, to reality. And Justice Thomas responded to one of Justice Jackson's arguments uh, in quite, quite sharp language. He wrote this, Individuals are the sum of their unique experiences, challenges, and accomplishments. What matters is not the barriers they face, but how they choose to confront them. And their race is not to blame for everything, good or bad, that happens in their lives. A contrary, myopic worldview based on individual skin color to the total exclusion of their personal choices is nothing short of racial determinism. That's Justice Thomas responding to a point made by Justice Jackson. I want to ask you about this sort of, he, he sort of says it's either or, either we're in a colorblind world or we're in a world where the argument is based on a, what he calls a myopic worldview that individual skin color is the thing that determines everything in their life. Is that a fair dichotomy that he's presenting? And if not, where's the nuance? I don't think it's a fair dichotomy. I think it's very much a straw man, in part because no one, no one in our conversation or in the conversation among the justices is making the claim that race is the single most determinative thing. Everyone acknowledges, even 150 years ago, right, that exceptional individuals can make their way, that even talented and not quite exceptional individuals can make their way and find success. The 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 dispute, I suppose, is what do we do about group inequality? And this gets back to my, my opening statement here, that we can perceive not just individual differences in talent uh, and in will and these sorts of things, but like group inequalities that are tied to a very well-established historical record. And so we have kind of, I think with Thomas, Justice Thomas and his colleagues, Justice Jackson in particular, what, what they have is a fundamental disagreement. I think Thomas would say and has said that more or less as long as exceptional individuals can get out of, can surpass uh, group inequalities in their legacy, that we don't have to worry too much about group inequalities. And I think Justice Jackson, who is very much an egalitarian, is saying that, no, that we need to deal with group inequalities. And race, racism, these are this is a particular vector of inequality that we can't simply ignore. And that's my position, that whatever your views of racial identity or what have you, the fact remains that this is a major vector under which over which inequality happens. And it seems foolhardy to ignore it or conflate it with other forms of inequality. That's a point Coleman made earlier that we haven't addressed yet, but that race inequality is different than class inequality because the former implicates one's personhood in a way that class inequality doesn't necessarily. And that's, that's a, I think, a key distinction worth making. And Coleman, this, the, the same question to you, D Justice Thomas, presenting this dichotomy that either you embrace colorblindness or if you're not, you're in a world where you're myopically saying race is responsible for everything that goes on in your life. Do you think that that's a fair dichotomy? No, I don't think that's a fair dichotomy. I think there's a lot of gray area in between and I wouldn't... Uh... I wouldn't besmirch anyone who disagrees with me as as thinking race is the only thing in life. 
however, we should back up and understand the disagreement between the justices is into in the context of affirmative action, which is not a policy that has anything to do with deep inequality in our society, but a policy that that affects, according to Princeton sociologist Thomas Espenshade, about one percent of Black and Hispanic eighteen-year-olds in any given year. The other 99%, they actually they either didn't graduate high school or they didn't go to a college selective enough to practice affirmative action. The class-based policies that I'm talking about, that Dr. King advocated, they are actually getting to the core of intergenerational poverty, the real issue, rather than a race-based policy that is frankly about Black and Hispanic elites like me that by and large are not at the core of what we're talking about when we talk about the legacy of slavery and so forth. So I, my position, it was the position of the civil rights movement, which is that broad-based class anti-poverty programs without regard, the, without regard to race are the serious interventions with respect to all of the history and current inequalities that continue to exist. All right, we're going to take a break and we'll be right back with some more discussion and questions from some guests. Welcome back, everybody, to Open to Debate. I'm John Donvan. We have Jamel Bowie and Coleman Hughes debating this question. Does colorblindness perpetuate racism? And something we like to do from time to time in the program is to bring in other voices uh, who have uh, people who have been thinking and writing about the same issue that we're debating. And we have four guests who are going to join the conversation sequentially. Uh, first up, we have Candace Watts-Smith, who is an associate professor of political science at Duke and a freelancer for The Washington Post. Candace, thanks so much for uh, joining us. You can go visible and unmute. Um, I'm not seeing you. Are you There you are. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I prefer if you come in with a question, so I hope you have a question ready to go, and, um, and, and please go and welcome. Sure. Thanks. Thanks um, to all involved. Um, uh, one thing that we've heard over and over is um, Sandra Day O'Connor's uh, quote uh, from her Bollinger decision that we expect that in 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further, um, in this case, uh, the interest in student body diversity approved today. Um, and I guess, you know, and Candace, thought, that was that was 2001. She wrote that 2003. Uh, 2003. I, so we're coming up to the end of her 25 years. Okay. Yes. Um, and, you know, I always thought that was a, a, a kind of odd prediction that hinged on time or expiration rather than some sort of metric of racial progress. Coleman, um, my sense is that uh, maybe you kind of feel like we've moved significantly forward, especially since the civil rights movement. I, I've, I've read that um, on your Substack and Jamil, it seems that you are focused on uh, kind of contemporary inequalities based on race, um, health disparities, uh, criminal legal system, so on and so forth. My question is, what are our, like what, is a good metric of racial progress. When do we know that the time for not really considering race in public policy has come? Or um, just to wrap around, um, you know, Wendell Phillips, you know, how do we know when that day comes? Jamel, can you take that first? Sure. I, I think my focus on group inequality and inequalities across um, uh, different different realms offers the right kind of metric, right? So we know right now, for example, that a middle-class black family, this is from uh, the sociologist Patrick Sh uh, Sharkey's book, Stuck in Place, that a black middle-class family lives in a poverty-stricken neighborhood uh, with a degree of the typical black middle-class family exists in a neighborhood with a level of poverty that the typical white middle-class family will never experience in their lives. Like that's, that's a thing that we know. And so we can have a metric, right? Like one possible metric is looking at neighborhood poverty, neighborhood inequality, socioeconomic uh, integration. And socioeconomic integration, in this case, uh, has a clear racial component because Black families are existing in a very different kind of space. It's the legacy of past policies. That is not even legacy of past policies, sort of like the direct consequences of past policies. Legacy makes it seem very amorphous. But no, this is a direct consequence. And so if... 30 years down the road, we find that there's no meaningful difference 
uh, in the kinds of uh, disadvantage faced by middle class black and white families. And we can say, yeah, we've made considerable racial progress. Now, for me, this does happen against the backdrop of, as, as Coleman described, like class based policy. But class based policy has to also take account of this other dimension of inequality, which is actually the civil rights position. The civil rights position is we have to take account of this dimension of racial inequality in addition to doing broad based class based actions. The two have to happen in tandem. It's not one or the other. Coleman, I, I want to give you a chance to answer the question, but I think your answer to the question is we're already there. So I'm not sure how how to relate it to you in terms no. of the, the metrics being there to 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 not have to not have race based yeah. policies. Let me briefly respond to 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 Jamel's point. He's correct to point out that even when you hold race constant, there can be leftover income differences such as the the statistic that he pointed let me to. clarify this isn't an income difference this is an exposure to so it's not so much that black middle class families have l less money uh, in the same neighborhood but yeah, that I but that it. they're in much more segregated and much agreed. poorer neighborhoods agreed so so just briefly to respond to that if i were a college administrator who wanted to factor that in to my calculus which is a valid point of view whether you agree with it or not what would be the better thing to do? To use race as a second best proxy for that, or actually to get the data on people's census tracts from their address and incorporate that into some sort of adversity score? I would very much say the second, and that would be consistent with my position. I don't think that we should use race as a second or third best proxy for something else when we can actually use that thing uh, directly. Now, to address myself to the questioner's point, I think it is based on a false premise that colorblindness depends on some era that we have reached as a society. Colorblindness is a philosophy of how to fight racism that in principle makes sense no matter how much or how little racism there is. That is why the colorblind philosophy was at the heart of the civil rights movement when there was far more racism than there is today. So it's not like colorblindness only makes sense when you get to a certain point point. It is a method of fighting racism, regardless of how much there is in society. Candace, thank you very much for your question. Um, I now want to bring in uh, for our next question, Thomas Chatterton Williams. Uh, Thomas is a, a contributing writer for The Atlantic. He is author of Self-Portrait in Black and White, Unlearning Race. Um, and Thomas, you have uh, debated with us previously, so it's good to see you back with us again. Uh, thanks for joining us and come on in with your question. Hi, thanks for having me and thank you to Open Debate, Open to Debate and Ted for hosting such a urgent and important conversation. Um, putting aside the question momentarily, does colored blindness perpetuate racism? I'd like to focus on what color consciousness and practice often does. There have long been studies in the American Journal of Education and elsewhere showing that nearly half of all so-called black students at Ivy League universities are either foreign born or children of immigrants who are often far more upwardly mobile than American descendants of slaves. It seems that such color consciousness that would conflate the experiences of all so-called black people around the world might even work contrary to American black people's specific interests, as well as the interests, of course, of other Americans of other ethnic backgrounds who are also competing for coveted spaces in this society. How then does such a consistently disingenuous proxy for past discrimination adequately address a system of inequality in Jamel's framing in a fair and relevant way for all Americans, but specifically those who are poor or descendants of American slaves? Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Jamel, I think the question was mostly directed to you, but Coleman, you're going to get a shot at it also. Mm. Sure. I, I, it, it's a great question. I, you know, I think it's interesting that this conversation is moving slowly and slowly to affirmative action in college admissions, for which I don't necessarily hold the view that affirmative action in college admissions is sacrosanct. I don't particularly care about Harvard's attempt to have some sort of like racially balanced class. I think, as I've been emphasizing this entire time, that the relevant things when we're talking about race and public policy are group inequalities that, yes, affect the, uh, the most disadvantaged people in our society. And so in that case, in, in, in the case of actual disadvantage, not simply sort of like the particular, you know, college placement of uh, upper income elites, right? I think color consciousness has a real 
role to play, whether that's in housing policy, whether that is in designing a social safety net, and, and, and a wide variety of circumstances. In addition to thinking about broad-based universal policies, we also have to think about this other dimension of inequality and ways to directly address it and directly touch it and directly affect it the same way we think about class inequality, the same way we think about gender inequality. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of education, right, that to me would mean a massive investment first in uh, primary, secondary, and higher education, constructing new colleges, really bolstering the workforce, revitalizing higher education in this country. And, you know, the conversation about elite universities really uh, misses the fact that higher education is in a state of crisis. So it's, it's, it's sort of doing land grant universities part two, right? Uh, and then also thinking specifically about like what places in the country, what communities in the country need the greatest access to just sort of like the best possible education we can provide them. Um, that is going to require us to think about racial inequality. Uh, Coleman mentioned the idea of an adversity score, something I, I don't disagree with whatsoever. But it does seem funny to me, right, that like we can think of all of these uh, ways to uh, create proxies for disadvantage instead of just saying straightforwardly, yeah, like the descendants of black, black uh, enslaved Black Americans, the descendants of people who are affected by Jim Crow, they face a particularized situation, and we just need to like deal with that. That seems to me much more honest and, and straightforward uh, in dealing with uh, problems of inequality than what, to my mind, is just talking around it and finding ways to talk around it. I, mm -hmm. I want to say I, I I feel Jamel slightly dodged Thomas's point, his point being that race conscious policy, race as a variable runs roughshod over many of the important distinctions, such as whether you're a descendant of slaves, where you are from, your group level income, Nigerian Americans, um, much higher income than uh, black Americans descended from slaves. And yet, all of the race-based policies by definition lump them together while at the same time claiming that they are trying to address those sub variables that they are running roughshod over and that well, is me... one reason why that, that's one reason why i'm in favor I, i'm hardly against policies that are meant to curb disadvantage but to use race as a proxy for it is just choosing to use a, a worse, less precise proxy when there are better, more precise ones available. So two things. Um, the first is if, if Coleman feels that I'm dodging the question, then I, you know, to, to address it more head on then, you know, part of the part of the issue is right is that we're affirmative action programs happen in the context prior to this previous Supreme Court decision, uh, Milliken v. Bradley in 1973, 74. Uh, which basically ruled out the possibility of using college admissions or anything as a kind of recompense or directly touching the question of racial inequality. The Supreme Court said you can only consider diversity, right? So in that context, yeah, that critique is totally right. It's a critique I've made myself that affirmative action policies don't actually, they're, they're too race consciousness in that manner under those circumstances uh, doesn't address the direct question of inequality. It touches it, but doesn't address it directly. You can imagine a world, let's say a Fortis doesn't leave the court and all of a sudden the composition of the court is a little different. And the court says, no, you can consider past racial inequality directly in terms of doing college admissions. In that case, is it is that a proxy? No, that's just directly touching the thing. And so I think it's, I, I've made this point before, but I really think and this is why I've been trying to keep the, I've been trying to really focus on this question of group inequality, because once we get into this stuff, now we're thinking about the legal architecture here. And the legal architecture is, in fact, informed by these debates about what constitutes colorblindness, what constitutes race consciousness. Uh, 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 and I think that when we're talking about affirmative action in college admissions in 2023, pre this ruling, we do have to take note of the fact that the court essentially set up a situation that would produce the outcome that uh, 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 Thomas was describing in his question. Coleman, do you feel that it was less dodged that time? Yes, I do feel that like it was less okay. dodged. Um, although, I mean, the, the point still remains, I guess, that you you receive the the racial groups as 
the best groups to be using as metrics in public policy. I didn't say when, that. I've never, I've never said yeah, that. I, I don't said, think I've heard Jamel say that either. I've said okay. that when well, addressing enough. racial so, inequality, we should direct, we should address racial inequality. That's my claim. So how do you feel about ethnic inequality, given that it's enormous, the difference in income and outcomes between different white ethnic groups are vast and the differences in outcomes between that? black. Sure, sure. So if you look at the difference in income between American white Americans of French descent and white Americans of Russian descent, it's like 80 cents on the dollar, for example. Uh, how do you distinguish between those groups? Uh, I mean, if you look at the difference between Indian Americans and Pakistani Americans, outcomes are vastly different uh, in terms of income. So how do you distinguish between the, the groups that inequality in which justifies policies that name those groups and use those groups as categories and those that don't? Jamel, I, I want to ask you if you can be brief because I want to get to our uh, next sure, question. Sure. Thanks. I think this is a very simple thing to answer. The simple answer is when it comes to generalized income inequality, we have universal policies for that. When it comes to inequalities that we can tangibly trace to past decisions by the state, by private interests, to specifically disadvantage a group on the question on the basis of race, then you pay attention to that specifically. Thank you for that. And thank you, Thomas, for your question. And Monica Williams, you can come, uh, you turn on your camera. I, I want to invite Monica Williams, a professor of psychology at the University of Ottawa and a licensed clinical psychologist and freelancer for psychology today to join the conversation. Thanks, uh, Monica, for joining us. Come on in. Oh, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so my question is this. Well, first of all, targeting poverty, it is a worthy goal, but it's a mistake to think that that's going to eliminate racism. For example, most if not all Black Americans, even those who are well off financially, still suffer from racism. And the majority of Black Americans are not poor. Most are middle class. Middle class and affluent Black people still face racism, like glass ceilings in the workplace, as we're unfairly denied promotion, we receive inferior medical care, and on average, we do not have all the advantages of white matched peers. And as a clinical psychologist, I've, I see many people of color of all income levels suffering from racial trauma. In other words, symptoms of PTSD due to racism that they've experienced in their lives. And so how can we address problems like this from a colorblind perspective? Coleman, that sounds like a challenge to your position. So I'd like you to take it first. Well, I'd like to remind the, the, the questioner of the, I don't know if I'd call it trauma, but the deep, um, the deep distress that is precisely caused by some of the race conscious policies that are allegedly fixing racism, such as the one I pointed out in my opening remarks about Asian students hiding their Asianness on their college applications. Uh, this is a direct result, not of colorblindness, but of race conscious policies. Now, if you're talking about people that have experienced racism, I've experienced racism. I understand racism is a deep human scourge. It exists in every society. It is like like hate and aggression. It it is part of the uh, the the worst angels of our nature. Uh, to say that it it is not gone is a is a truism because it's never going to go away completely any more than murder or hatred or jealousy or envy in general. What we can do is raise our children enshrined with the principles of the civil rights movement, namely to judge people uh, based on the content of their character rather than their skin color, uh, to insist that they be treated that way by others and to eliminate further race injury from our public policy. Jamil? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll respond to, to Coleman's response there. Um, I, I feel like I need to contest this notion that racism is some sort of timeless evil been with human beings in memorial, because I think it, that kind of forms the foundation 
of the disagreement we have here. Now, I said in my opening statement that race is historically contingent, and that's the case. We can see in legal documents, we can see in the construction of legal codes across what's now called what we call the new world, we can see the construction of racism and the construction of race as a result. It's a historically contingent phenomena that is the product of a particular set of material relations between groups, right? And so that implies, if it's historically contingent, that implies that it's not actually some timeless thing. It's a thing that is constructed, that is inscribed, and it's reinscribed over time through different institutions, through different structural features of a society, through different relationships between groups. And does so, that make you, my, does that make you an optimist, Jamel? I think that makes me an optimist. I, I I very much believe in the capacity of human action to like make a better world for ourselves. And so, in my view, right, the reason to address. Uh, directly address racial inequality isn't because of something that has to do with racial identity, isn't because of something intrinsic to people, none of that. It's just that it's a it's a powerful vector for inequality that shapes our society, and that we should do something about it the same way that we would do anything about any other form of inequality, insofar that we're egalitarians. I acknowledge that not all of us are egalitarians, but I am, and I think race egalitarianism is very much a part of that. Coleman, before I go into the next question, any other thought on um, Monica's question? I'm a race egalitarian as well, in the sense that I believe that the law and in our personal lives, we should not treat people with regard to race. We should not racially discriminate. But the issue, the issue is not our personal interactions here. The issue is like structural group inequality, right? Like I'm colorblind in my everyday life, right? I don't treat people differently on the basis of race, but I'm also very much aware of structural group inequality as a result of historically contingent things and things that we can see in the public record, in policy, in law, and all of these things. That's to me the the important. That's the that's the vector for which uh, on which we're discussing. Not so much our individual relations, which again, people should be colorblind person to person, but in terms of public policy, in terms of uh, the shape and nature of our society. Thanks there for your question, a, Monica. Is, and Coleman, you can continue, and then I'm going to go to our next questioner. There's a Mott and Bailey happening here where, you know, obviously what I'm critical of are actual policies with, which discriminate against people on, on a vector that they can't control, namely their race, in the name of justice. But what you defend is that you are just aware of the history. Of course, I'm not against being aware of the history. I'm not against being aware of the structural inequalities that have obtained throughout American history. I'm against uh, the race conscious approach, the toxic race conscious approach to allegedly fixing them by creating more racist policy. I, I want to bring in our, I, I, just because of time, Jamel, if that's okay, thanks for your, <laughs> thanks for your forbearing. Uh, I want to bring in Robert George, who is an independent journalist. Uh, Robert, come on into the conversation and the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and in the uh, interest of full disclosure, I should say uh, I was uh, born in Trinidad and grew up partly in England. So uh, I bring that kind of perspective um, into this. Um, my, my, my question is, and this touches a little bit on the Sandra Day O'Connor's opinion from, from, from 20 years ago. Um, so much of our history um, has been based on, uh, for what a, for uh, one of a better phrase, um, the black-white um, binary um, when it comes uh, when it comes to race. Um, uh, one of the I think insights uh, that came out of Sandra Day O'Connor's decision is that uh, America, circa uh, 2023 or 2028, what do you want to when you talk about it, is very different than it was uh, in 1960 in 1963 when King um, spoke um, at the at the march on Washington. And so um, my question is, um, are we in a sense being forced into something? of a colorblind position when it comes to public policy, given that the black-white binary has, in a sense, largely collapsed. Um, Coleman mentioned a couple of times um, how uh, you know, certainly the uh, Harvard uh, decision was kind of uh, focusing on the issues of uh, Asian, um, Asian American students um, and Given that's where we are, given that's where we are now, do we need to create a new um, language 
for dealing with these things because even the phrase people of color now sends, tends to focus more just on black and Hispanics and, and Asians have become now almost honorary whites in, in given the language we've had in the okay. past. I, again, um, we're down to about our last two minutes. So I'm gonna give each of you a minute to answer that question and Coleman, you can go first. I think I understand what you're saying. I mean, I think when the when the nation opened up to immigration in 1965 and we got lots of people that were not uh, white and black in the typical way we think of that as Americans, it did create a problem because in 65, you could make uh, a, a very compelling, you know, short term um, recompensation argument and it would not end up hurting immigrants who just arrived here because the borders had been effectively closed for 40 years. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I do think the increase in diversity has moved us towards a more logical and long run sound position, which is that we're not going to invite people to this country as immigrants and then start um, putting, putting them into a racially rigged machine. That's not the deal that America should be about anymore. Um, this is my... I have been making a essentially a claim for specificity when targeting inequality, and I think that applies here as much as anywhere else. The presence of other groups, and it's important to say, right, that sort of like ethnicity, right, is a socially constructed thing. These are all socially constructed. So, you know, if it's in the in the 1920s, you could think of um, uh, the United States as being a multiracial country, just sort of like the races or various categories of European, right? Um, we are, we want to, in my view, we want to specifically target the consequences of racist public policy for those affected by racist public policy. And that means, it means specifically about that vector of inequality. And so that to me, it, in the abstract, right, like let's set aside the political considerations, but just in terms of, sort of can it work? Um, I think it can work just as well in a much more diverse society than it would uh, uh, in a supposedly binary society. I don't think that I don't think I don't think that is um, uh, out of the question. Thank you, Jamel, and thank you, Robert, and thank you to all of uh, our, our uh, the participants of the uh, from the last few minutes uh, coming in with your questions. We really appreciate it. We're going to move now into our closing round. Like our opening round, our closing round has a little bit of formality to it. Each debater gets up to 90 seconds to make a closing argument or a closing point on why they are arguing yes or no in answer to our question, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? Um, Jamel, you are answering yes to the question, and this is your time for your closing statement. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for this, this really uh, uh, wonderful debate. This has been great. My position from the start has been that we need to, to, that to target a particular form of inequality. We actually have to be attentive to that particular form of inequality. We are attentive to class inequality by addressing the relations of domination between groups. We are attentive to gender inequality by addressing the relations of domination between groups. But for some reason that when it comes to race inequality, we've decided that it is beyond the pale to attend to the domination between groups. And I'm saying that, no, that's not the case at all. The constant recourse to individuals in this conversation, I think, is indicative of how very uncomfortable people are thinking about this in terms of group inequality. I, that's, that is my perspective here. Uh, and my perspective is that, uh, and I would consider my perspective to be the perspective of Wendell Phillips, to be the perspective of A. Philip Randolph, uh, to be the perspective of the Luminary the Civil Rights Movement, that we need to be not just attentive, we need to be both attentive to uh, system-wide inequality, but also the specific consequences of specific policies meant to immiserate or degrade particular groups of people. It's entirely possible, and we've seen it, to have policies that address everyone, but leave those particular forms of entrenched inequality intact. And I don't think that we want that. I think if we want a colorblind society, we don't want that. Thanks very much, Jamel. And so now, Coleman, you get the final word. Your rebuttal, please tell us again why you are answering no to the question, does colorblindness perpetuate racism? Yeah, so I think, like I said, there's been a very effective PR campaign against the notion of colorblindness. And I've tried to undo that meme for all of you today, partly by quoting, providing quote after quote of some of the great luminaries and activists 
in many cases specifically using the word colorblind and in other cases embodying the philosophy. Uh, I've, I've heard no analogous recitation of quotes on the other side, and I think uh, that, that, is, that that is telling. Now, I, I also heard no retort to the problem created recently of Asian kids in Queens, you know, having to hide their racial identities. Uh, I mean, I think this is telling as well, because no matter how many abstract, you know, academic redefinitions and concepts one wants to use, in the end, race-based policy always comes down to looking someone in the face and discriminating against them because of something that they can't control. That is not the way to address the legacy of racism. It's not the way Martin Luther King wanted to address the legacy of racism. Ultimately, the way to fight racism cannot be to focus more on the alleged uh, importance of race. It's to end race and policy altogether and focus on class. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Coleman. And that wraps the arguing portion of the program. So um, Jamel and Coleman, I wanna thank you so much for taking part in this debate and in particular for um, the way in which you argued, uh, obviously in good faith, but also with respect for one another. That's what we try to embody here at Open to Debate. It's what we wanted to share with the TED audience as well, and we're delighted to have done that. I also want to thank um, the, the the four participants who came in with questions, uh, Candace and Robert and Thomas and Monica. Thank you. You actually took the conversation to more interesting places. Um, that is what we do here at Open to Debate. I want to let you know that uh, for those of you who follow us, you know that we are a nonprofit. We put these programs out to the world um, um, for, for for its edification, but we support uh, we are supported by people like you. And if you would like to support us, please go to our website I, uh, at opentodebate.org. That's it for this time. Uh, again, thank you to our debaters. I'm John Donvan, and we'll see you next time. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.